Starlight, starlight, first star I see tonight. Daddy, why is that star moving? That's not a star, honey. That's a satellite. CQ satellite, CQ satellite. CQ, CQ, CQ. From the publishers of CQ magazine. Hello, CQ20, CQ20, CQ20. See, this is KA at ODP. We'll show you the stack a little bit. Oscar, CQ Oscar 13. A CQ video operating guide. Getting started in amateur satellites. We grew up, you know, my generation with space, uh, you know, landing on the moon and so on. So it was fascinating to think that you know we could bounce a signal off a satellite and talk to someone is fantastic you know easily uh, talk to people from all most of the world at any one time depending upon where the satellite is and I can still remember my first contact uh, which was with a, a zero out in Kansas and it was just amazing that I could hear my voice go up to the satellite hear, hear it come back and besides that get to talk to somebody just the delay in your voice is neat it takes, a, there's about a half second delay sometimes on the satellite between when I talk and my voice comes back to me. It's just fantastic. It's almost hard to believe that it can happen. It really makes the world seem like a much smaller place because digital communication now spans the globe at, uh, at an, an incredibly rapid rate. I'm interested in the high-tech aspects of amateur radio, things like satellites, things like packet, digital signal processing, uh, possible digital audio via satellite, things like that. Trying to do things that haven't been done before is really why I'm interested in uh, satellites and ham radio is a vehicle for that. The, the interesting challenge for me is that the high-tech uh, nature of it and the idea of working with satellites that are thousands of miles up in space and participating in the, the move forward in technology. I really enjoy that a lot. The satellites involve uh, computer technology for tracking the orbits of the satellite and figuring out where the satellite is at any moment. Uh, the equipment, the system engineering of the antennas and feed lines and, and electronics have to be thought out carefully to get the best uh, value for the money you invest. Just the fact I can talk through an item going through space up there just is fantastic. Where else can you uh, build your own satellite station and operated at home. I don't know anybody else in town that, that has a, uh, a satellite station and can do the sort of things that, that I do with this. To most people, a home satellite station is something you hook up to your TV set to watch news in the making or to see movies. Most people wouldn't even think of sending signals up to a satellite. But ham radio operators are not most people. For hams, satellites are one more way of making two-way interactive contact with people around the world and of stretching technology into new frontiers. But even among hams, amateur satellites are often seen in the same way as stealth fighters. Super high-tech, super complex, super expensive. Nearly everyone knows they're out there, but very few have ever seen one, or heard one, or worked one. On that the satellite also, operators we just met will guide us through this unfamiliar terrain, explain what's us, out there and how to find it, show us what equipment we'll need, and introduce us to making contact through the Oscars, orbiting satellites carrying amateur radio. Ham Radio's own international fleet of communication satellites. Some three dozen amateur satellites have been built and launched since 1961. More than a dozen are operating today, relaying voice, code, packet, and even pictures for hams worldwide. 
And that doesn't include hams who are in orbit themselves. Many U.S. astronauts and their foreign partners are licensed amateurs, and several have operated from the space shuttle. Virtually all of the Russian cosmonauts who have occupied the Mir space station have been hams. And Mir's ham station includes a robot packet system that operates even when the cosmonauts are busy. Amateur satellites have been truly international with hams from nearly two dozen countries working together to plan, build, and launch them. Let's take a brief look at the different satellites that are available to hams today. Believe it or not, there are several satellites you can tune in, and some you can even work without specialized equipment. Oscar 21 offers Ham Radio's first orbiting FM repeater. When it's in range, and when it's operating in FM, the signal is sometimes so strong that you can pick it up on a two-meter handheld. Many hams make their first satellite contacts through one of the two Russian HF satellites, RS-1011 and RS-1213. All you need is a two-meter multi-mode transmitter and a 10-meter receiver, or even just an HF rig if you can transmit on 15 meters and quickly switch to receive on 10. There are two other groups of satellites. In fact, they're the mainstays of amateur satellite communication. But they do require specialized gear either for transmitting, receiving, or both. Oscar 10 and Oscar 13 are the long-haul, long-distance satellites, providing voice and Morse code contacts worldwide for hours at a time. And fine on your location being uh, not too far away from uh, the Danish border. And the newest stars in our satellite fleet are the PACSATs, orbiting packet bulletin boards. They can carry messages, and sometimes pictures, around the world in less than an hour. We'll discuss each of these satellite families in more detail. But first, we need to open our satellite dictionary and learn a few new words, along with some new meanings for familiar words. Like every aspect of, of ham radio, working on the satellites has its own collection of, of jargon and terminology that you use. The packet people have theirs and the traffic handlers have theirs and the satellite operators also have a series of terms you use. It's not difficult. It's a different language than uh, uh, some hams are used to. Uh, we're talking about mean anomalies and pointing angles and this, that and the other and it takes a little while to understand what folks are talking about. Uh, some of them have to do with the orbital mechanics of the satellite. You, you're concerned whether the satellite is in a high orbit or a low orbit. You're concerned about the shape of the orbit, so you, you get involved with terms like uh, apogee and perigee. In other words, is the satellite at the low point or the high point? What sort of orbit is it in? Is it in an inclined orbit? Uh, what portion of the orbit is the satellite in at, at the time? For example, uh, the term mean anomaly is used, MA, it's abbreviated, uh, and that's a, a means of measuring how far into the orbit a particular satellite is. Pointing angle of the satellite has to do with how close the antennas on the satellite are pointed at your location. Uh, it's an off pointing percentage. The higher the, the higher the number, the more the antennas are looking away from you. For instance, with my equipment, I like to see a uh, pointing angle of about 30 degrees or less and I like to see a range or distance between me and the satellite of 30,000 kilometers or less. I know with my equipment and my setup from experience that I will have a pretty good shot at making communications that day. So you, you do have to pick up a, a number of pieces of jargon on what's involved with the satellite. Uh, from the radio standpoint, uh, you worry about uplink and downlink. I think that's not just ham radio satellite jargon. You have the same thing uh, with uh, people listening to TV on satellite dishes and they're talking about the downlink signal. There's some terminology involved there for locking the transmitter to the receiver because the satellite is inverting in frequency. Uh, if you want to move the receive frequency up, you have to move the transmit frequency down. As I move my uplink higher in frequency in the 435 band, my downlink, that same signal that I'm sending up, moves lower in frequency in the two meter band. 
it's not a one for one, it's a, you're moving opposite directions. The transponder inverts. Uh, there is uh, terminology involved with antennas. Uh, people use the computers to aim the antennas at the satellite. Uh, so you're concerned with azimuth and elevation tracking of, of the satellite. Uh, terminology they use there is auto track, where the computer automatically makes the antennas track the satellite. And there are a few other things. There's uh, spin modulation and people think of, I don't know what kind of, there's all kinds of images could be conjured up for spin modulation, but what that has to do is with the satellite turning, rotating for stability, it will make signals rise and fall and rise and fall as you listen to them. Uh, like any other specialized field of endeavor, there's a, a series of, of buzzwords and acronyms that, that are used, but uh, they're not all that complicated and it doesn't take long to get used to them. <laughs> But that's a matter of education. Uh, the magazines always run articles about satellite communications. They have satellite specials, just like they have antenna special magazine issues once or twice a year. You can pick up the lingo pretty quick. Here's a quiz question. What do ham radio satellites have in common with train whistles, faraway galaxies, and a 19th century Austrian physicist? Give up? Well, our friend from Austria is the key. Christian Doppler was the first person to explain why the pitch of a train whistle seemed to change as the train approached or moved away from the listener. According to Doppler, the frequency of a sound wave appears to get higher as it gets closer and lower as it moves away. This Doppler effect, or Doppler shift as it's called, applies to all sorts of waves. Satellite communication is also subject to Doppler shift. Two, and operators three, always need four, to keep that in mind. One, two, three, four. By design, a certain uplink frequency should come down at a certain point. But because the satellite's spinning out in space and is constantly moving either away from us or toward us in its uh, orbit around the Earth, the received frequency changes a little bit, and that's due to Doppler shift. Uh, so I transmitted a little bit on the designated frequency and tuned around looking for, for my signal coming down. And we found it, and so here we are. CQ satellite, CQ satellite. Of course, there are other words you'll want to learn as you discover more about working satellites. Things like squint angle and the Terminator. No, Arnold Schwarzenegger is not on Oscar 13. And there are other words we'll introduce as the program moves along. But there is one term that causes so much confusion that we need to give it special mention. To most hams, the word mode refers to the type of signal coming out of the radio. Code, voice, packet, whatever. On satellites, though, modes are different. They have letters, and they refer to the bands on which a satellite is operating. Virtually all amateur satellites operate full duplex, with an uplink on one band and a downlink on another. The most common arrangement is mode B, where you transmit on 70 centimeters and receive on 2 meters. Hotel Juliet Zulu. Let's take, for example, Oscar 13. I'm putting up a signal at 435.493 at mode B, and it's coming down to me at 145.905. That's the standard mode B configuration. Mode B gives us a fairly large bandwidth. Uh, it, what we're looking at is we're talking about going from the signals that we're hearing at 145.835 all the way up through 145.975. So a rather large passband. That's mode B. Mode J is just the opposite. What mode J would be is that I'm going to come up to the satellite with a 144 signal and it's going to come back to me at a 435 signal. Then we go to uh, mode L. In mode L, we have to have a 1269 signal. And how we get that 1269 signal is I start out with a 2 meter signal, and then I take it over here to a thing called a transmit converter. This one happens to be an SSB model that takes the 2 meter signal and comes out at 1269. The 1269 signal then comes up to an amplifier, which amplifies the signal up to approximately 200 watts, and then up to the roof where a set of antennas used for the uplink. The downlink is the 435 here. Then mode S then, we're using again a 435 signal up to the satellite, 
But for mode S coming down, we've got 2400 megahertz, a, a lot higher frequency than what we've used on other frequencies, on other uh, satellites. So what I do there is I have a set of antennas and a preamp at the antenna. And it comes down over that little silver box there. Doesn't look like much, you know, just an old tin box. But then in that tin box is a converter. And that converter takes the signal at 2400 and brings it back down to two meters, which is received on here. So the building blocks become having basically a good two meter and a good 70 centimeter or 435, whatever you want to call it, transceiver that gives you the capabilities of having sin uh, single sideband and CW and when we talk about the microsats and so on, an FM capability. And then by the use of either a transmit converter or like a receive converter over there, we get the different combinations for working the satellites. Ron has led us from the language of satellites into another important area. How to set up a satellite station for a variety of modes without going broke. How you set up your station will depend largely on the satellite or satellites you plan to work. So let's take a closer look at the different amateur satellites and what they do. QSL. There are two main types of amateur satellites, analog and digital. The analog satellites instantly retransmit whatever sort of signals are sent up to them, mostly single sideband voice and Morse code. They've been compared to orbiting repeaters. If analog satellites are like repeaters, then digital satellites are like packet bulletin boards. They store and forward messages and other computer-readable files. Usually, there is no way to have a live two-way QSO on a digital satellite. Your signal is Let's start with five, the analog five, satellites. Five, All of them seven, feature what's five, called a linear and, uh, transponder. Very, uh, day, Rather than operating on a single North frequency, Carolina. like a standard About, repeater, uh, a transponder retransmits a whole range of frequencies called the passband. Any signal sent up within the passband of the uplink will be retransmitted on the downlink. This way, many people can use the satellites at the same time. Many hams are already equipped to operate the two Russian satellites, RS-1011 and RS-1213. Each of these has two separate transponders, so that's why they each have two numbers. Only one transponder per satellite is active at any time. The downlink on, on uh, RS-10 and 11 is 10 meters, and the uplink is 2 meters. So once again, we start out with a 2, big, two meter signal, we go up to the satellite with that, and we come back down on 10 meters, and that's RS-10 and 11. We've got also then RS-12 and 13, which is a combination of 15 meters and 10 meters, and uh, can be done with, with your HF rig. You can work this mode, mode K, with one radio if you can quickly switch between transmitting on 15 meters and receiving on 10. Doppler shift on HF is very slight, so you can use the published frequency guides and be close enough to make contacts. By the way, the transponders on the RS satellites are non-inverting, so you don't have to worry about tuning up on one band and down on the other. The Russian satellites are relatively easy to work, but since they're in low Earth orbits, they're within range of wherever you are for only about 15 minutes on each pass or orbit and only on a few passes each day. That's not true of our other two analog satellites, Oscar 10 and Oscar 13. These are the long haul workhorses of ham radio satellites. Oscar 13 in particular provides regular reliable communications across huge areas of the Earth for several hours at a time. That's because the satellite's high elliptical orbit keeps it visible to much of the world for most of each orbit. If you want to try satellite DXing, this is your bird. Someone here in West Africa could talk to someone in Peru. At the same time, I could talk to someone in uh, Moscow, along with someone back over here in Siberia to talk to someone uh, in Brazil. Working on the satellite is very much like looking for DX, uh, except you have a, a more defined window. You can look at the map and see where you should be able to get to, uh, assuming someone's there who's uh, properly equipped to, to work you. OH3LWP, OH3LWP, from Whiskey 4, Hotel Juliet Zulu. 
Let's take a look at the satellite station that I have here and I'll sort of walk you through the equipment that I am using here. And I'll describe what I use for mode B, which is the most widely used uh, mode of the Oscar 13 satellite. It requires that you uplink, uh, have an uplink transmission to the satellite at around 435 megahertz. And so what I use is a, a, a standard all mode 435 megahertz transceiver. This one happens to be an ICOM 10 watt 435 megahertz uh, single sideband transceiver. Uh, the output from this at 10 watts, I feed into a power amplifier, which is located over here, which boosts the power to about the 100 watt level. I then have about 80 feet of coax feed line up to the roof to the antenna. Uh, that 80 feet of coax at, at 435 megahertz probably has 3 dB loss, so I only have 50 watts coming out the top end of the feed line to the antennas. Uh, the antennas are on an azimuth and elevation mount, uh, which can aim the antennas at the satellite and I'm using cross-polarized Yagi antennas, which gives me circular polarization. And that uh, reduces the amount of fading on the signal to the satellite because of tumbling and, and cross-polarization effects are minimized by circular polarization. For the receiving or the downlink from the satellite, the satellite takes the received 435 megahertz signal and translates it to the two meter band and downlinks around 145.9 megahertz. Uh, then because the signal is very weak, I use a preamplifier mounted up on the roof, very close to the antenna, uh, which has a very low noise figure. Receiving on the satellite downlink is usually the most critical part of a station, and if you're going to spend money on, on good equipment, you're best to spend the money first on the receiving setup, the receiving antenna and a low noise preamplifier, preferably mounted up on the antenna. For satellite work, no matter what the satellite, other than the RS-10 and 11 and the 12 and 13, the HF satellite, you are going to need a mass-mounted preamp. And there's where we're talking about some money. We're talking about a hundred dollar investment. Okay, I mean that's 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 the key because again you're dealing with weak signals. We're not dealing with a signal that we get from our local FM repeater. So we need to have some amplification and we need to have the amplification right at the antenna so that we can get the greatest signal down to us so we can receive. That's probably the greatest failing point with regards to satellite is to try and avoid putting up mass mounted preamps. You have to. Uh, when you use low noise preamplifiers up on the uh, roof, uh, you have to be very careful of these amplifiers that the RF from your transmitter uh, doesn't get into them and blow up the input transistors, which are very sensitive to noise. So I have another circuit up here, small circuitry, which is called a sequencer, which sequences the, uh, the way the receiver is switched off, the preamplifier is protected with coax relays, and then the transmitter is turned on to send the RF up. And that sequencer uh, operates these things over a, a few millisecond intervals. I use that sequencer to make sure that the receiver is properly protected uh, before the uh, RF energy comes out of the 100 watt transmitter and goes up. Once you do that, uh, the uh, antenna mounted preamps can be very reliable. If you don't do that, uh, you may get into trouble. For antenna control, I'm using an azimuth and elevation uh, rotor control uh, with up and down and left and right controls which can manually adjust uh, the antennas. Also, this is coupled through this small unit as an interface unit to the computer. And the computer can then automatically drive the antenna rotor and track the satellite. Back to you, FC1 MSL. This is November 2 Alpha Alpha Mike. Over. It's very important to be able to point up at the satellite. It's not like a, a typical low band beam where you're just concerned in, in running around 360 degrees of the compass, you have to go up as well because you're dealing with an object which is moving in all three planes of motion. The standard configuration that you see for the satellite is the old circular polarized antennas. The uh, 14 element 2 meter antenna, the 18 element 435 antenna, and mixed in there also is a, the mode S downlink antenna and the mode L uplink antenna. Finally, these are the rotators. Um, that control the beams that are on the roof. And those rotators are driven by computer control. So that when the satellite comes above the horizon, the uh, computer automatically points the antennas via this rotor box at the point of the, uh, of the horizon where the satellite will be coming up. It then tracks the satellite as it moves across the sky. Finding the satellites is not very hard. Uh, if, you, if you own a computer, you can find out where the satellites are. 
Uh, so many people are on packet these days and already have a computer. You can get the Keplerian elements, the, the data that you need to insert in your program to track the satellite. And you can get a satellite program, some of the best available from AMSAT, uh, the quick track programs and the instant track programs. There are versions for almost any computer that's out there now. The other thing that phase, the or mean anomaly that we were talking about, the schedule of the satellite is built around that. When you're tracking the satellite, they will publish a schedule that between this mean anomaly and this mean anomaly, it will be in mode B. So if you have mode B equipment, that's when you operate. It's senseless to try and uplink in mode B to the satellite when it's in mode L. It, it just won't work. So you need that the data from the computer to let you know what's going on. It's easy to keep your computer up to date. Keplerian elements can be downloaded for free from a variety of packet and telephone bulletin boards. Don't worry if the numbers make no sense to you. They will to your tracking program, and that's what matters. You need a computer to track Oscars 10 and 13. But you can manually figure out when and where to find the low-orbiting satellites with something called the Oscar locator. You'll find one in the back of the ARRL's Satellite Experimenter's Handbook. And in case you were wondering, Keplerian elements are named for Johann Kepler, the German astronomer who described the laws of planetary motion more than 300 years ago. Once you've found the satellite, you'll need to find yourself on the downlink before you can talk to anyone. If you have an auto-tracking radio or computer program, it's no problem. For everyone else, there are charts to help you find the right neighborhood. But because of Doppler shift, you'll need to tune around to spot your exact frequency. That may be harder than you think. On the satellite, because the, the satellite is inverting transponder, and uh, uh, when you want to lower your receive frequency, it means you have to raise your transmitter frequency, there are, there are some complications to zero beating uh, a station in order to uh, start a QSO, to answer a call. Another technique that people use is to have a key here and just hit the key and send a series of dashes and then tune the transmitter or tune the receiver until they hear their signal go by. Uh, that's kind of obtrusive to stations that are already in QSO. So I use another technique and it's a simple little audio oscillator that I built with a transistor and a battery which just gives an audio tone. And uh, I use that uh, to send an audio tone out of my transmitter on the uplink and I listen to it on the downlink and then I adjust the transmitter so that the, the received frequency is exactly the same tone as I'm sending up and then I know my transmitter and receiver are exactly zero beat with each other. You need to understand the fact that this is a full duplex operation. Uh, you are transmitting on one band and receiving on another simultaneously and it is a little disconcerting for a new ham once he does start talking on a satellite to hear his own voice in his headphones. It, it, in fact, it is for me. If I haven't operated the satellite in a, in a couple of weeks or so and I come out here and operate, the first time I call CQ, I, I sound like my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth because I'm hearing my own voice come back down and it, it, it goofs you up a little bit. Oscar 10, by the way, is very similar to Oscar 13, but it's a much older brother and the years in space have taken their toll. Oscar 10 operates only in mode B, and its ground controllers don't have much control over it. But for now, at least, it continues to provide excellent long-distance coverage to many, many hams. Here's a quick review before we move on to digital satellites. The Russian RS satellites operate on 2 meters, 10 meters, and 15 meters, and can often be worked without special equipment. But their passes are brief, and coverage area is relatively small compared to Oscars 10 and 13. Those satellites, with their high elliptical orbits, offer lengthy passes that cover huge areas. But they require more of an investment. Multi-mode rigs, or converters for 145 and 435 megahertz, directional antennas with azimuth and elevation rotors, mast-mounted receive preamplifiers, and very low loss feed line between the antennas and the radios. But you don't have to do that all at once. You can work low level passes without an elevation rotor. And when the satellite's antennas are pointing straight back at you, you don't need circular polarization. 
you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, you know, like I talked about before with antennas. Now, yeah, we can talk about fancy antennas, but we can talk about cheap antennas, too. We can talk about antennas that you can homebrew, uh, you know, antennas that, that, that will work. Now, granted, you're not going to have the optimum signal 100% of the time on the satellite, but it's going to get you started, and that's the key. What you do need are two radios, or a multiband radio designed for working satellites, a way to turn your antennas and, in most cases, a computer to tell you where and when to point them. But if you've been a ham for a while, chances are you already have some or most of the pieces. So all you need to do is fill in the holes. Coming up, a look at digital satellites and a whole new branch of amateur television. Pay no attention to the voice behind the speaker. You're listening to a digital satellite. N2 AAM, N2 AAM, November 2, Alpha Alpha Mike. Yeah, N2 Alpha Alpha Mike, go ahead, you're in. Okay, N2 AAM, name is Dave. I am located in Metuchen, New Jersey. This is Oscar 21, part analog, part digital. An experimental satellite designed to offer a choice of many different digital modes. The FM repeater is one of them. You're hearing DSP, or Digital Signal Processing, in action. On the analog side, there's a regular linear transponder, which shares time with the digital modes. Like most repeaters, the FM portion of Oscar 21 has just one input and one output frequency. You can easily tune in the downlink on 145.9875 megahertz. But the uplink is at 435.016 megahertz. Most 70 centimeter FM rigs cover only 440 to 450. So you'll need a multi-mode rig or a transmit converter to get onto that 435 megahertz uplink frequency. Keep in mind that Oscar 21's transponder is shared by several modes so the FM repeater may not always be on. It just switched into data mode, 400 baud PSK telemetry. Another satellite that lives in both the analog and digital worlds is Japan's Fuji Oscar 20. It has a non-inverting transponder for CW and single sideband, plus a 1200 baud packet bulletin board. FO20 is usually running packet. Both transponders are on mode J, with a two meter uplink and 70 centimeter downlink. Moving on to digital only satellites, we start out with AMSAT Oscar 16 and the Argentinian LUSAT Oscar 19. These are full time packet mailboxes with a few differences from their earthbound cousins. First, the obvious one they're in orbit, so they can physically deliver messages to other parts of the world, and they make a round trip in less than an hour. Second, these satellites use something called PSK, or phase shift keying, to send their packets. That's a different type of modulation than ground-based packet stations use. So you need a special packet controller and modem in order to decode what the satellites are sending. Finally, because their time overhead is so short, they can't operate like regular packet bulletin boards. You never actually connect to the satellite in the traditional packet sense. You simply send the satellite short packets that request something be done and the satellite keeps you in a list uh, so that you know that the process is continuing. The files that we are getting from this satellite are not being transmitted in the usual fashion that we transmit files between bulletin boards. There's no acknowledgement at the end of each packet that I've received it. Instead, the files are being broadcast, and that's why everyone can receive all of the files at once. It also is the reason that holes occur in messages where packets are not entirely successfully received, but fortunately this software has the intelligence to go back and ask for whole, whole fills rather than asking for entire messages to be retransmitted. Oscars 16 and 19 have made worldwide message forwarding by satellite a reality, but they operate at the relatively slow speed of 1200 baud, or bits of information per second. There are two other digital satellites that transmit data at 9600 baud, eight times as fast. They are UOSAT, Oscar 22, and the Korean satellite, KITSAT. 
These satellites operate at such a high speed that automatic operation by computer is practically required. Ron Vanke, K8YAH, talks us through a typical pass of Oscar 22. The radio is now automatically changed. It's now locked in to the right frequency. So when the satellite comes over the horizon, which should be here shortly, and we'll know that when this light starts flashing totally, um, it'll track, and it'll automatically track as we go down. Okay, now we're starting to see our first thing. Someone had sent up and said, please send me something. It was called was W0SL. Here's another one, WD3Q just sent up. Okay, presently now we've downloaded 601 bytes. I've now sent up and said, I want to get message 54B7. This is the group of stations that are on now, and they're receiving information. It just came back to me and said, okay, KYH, my call. We're now going to send you down the four b pieces of information that you need to finish the file 54B7. Now it's already asked for another file called 54B5. What that file is, I'm not sure at this point, but it was something that I had pre-selected when I went through and, uh, to see what files or programs that I wanted to download. So we'll see that come up here just in a moment. What also is going on now, we can see that this is filling up. We have a three, a zero, another zero, an eight, myself, a four, a three, a five, another five, and a four. So you can see that there's a widespread geographical area that is working this satellite. Presently, this satellite would be probably over the center part of Canada, uh, coming, coming to the south. And uh, the program that I asked, 54B5, we've now started to get it. I've previously recorded some of that, and I have 56% of whatever that program is. And I will continue to get that file. And you can see here, other files are coming down from other requests. Not only do I get the file that I'm looking for, but everything else. So that, it, uh, for economy of scale, everyone gets everything, and then you pick and choose what you need. So as you can see now, it's filling up. We now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 stations that are on downloading information from the satellite. This mode is a lot different than live communications. You don't really type on, this, on the uh, keyboard live to another individual. Um, PACSAT's our message forwarding service uh, as much as anything. You can prepare a message to a station and get it all edited and then as the satellite passes over that will be uploaded and then delivered to that station as the satellite passes over them. Uh, normally you don't uh, have any possible way to type live to someone on the satellite. More and more of the satellites, the PACSATs are being used to forward bulletin board traffic uh, to stations around the world becoming part of the, the long-distance forwarding service. John Hansen, WA0PTV, lives in Fredonia, New York. His station links terrestrial packet to the satellites. My station is a somewhat unusual satellite station because it operates as a satellite gateway station. I have a bulletin board, a standard VHF, UHF-based uh, amateur bulletin board that goes on here. And in addition, it interfaces with the satellite equipment so that messages flow into my bulletin board and when they're addressed to people on the other end of the country or the other end of the world the messages are uh, automatically sent to the satellite gateway and automatically uploaded to the gateway similarly the station also automatically downloads messages from the satellite for people all over the east coast typically we'll have messages delivered and sometimes even responses obtained in a period of less than 24 hours so that I can uh, hold on a, a, a meaningful conversation with friends in California or, or Australia by typing in messages and receiving responses and getting the responses back in less than a day um, almost as quickly as I get responses from the people around town that check into my bulletin board once a day. One of the really wonderful things about satellite gateways is that you don't have to actually own all this equipment in order to use the satellite gateway. No matter where you are in the United States, you're not too far from a satellite gateway. And you can use that satellite gateway to send messages to friends of yours all over the world. You don't have to live near a gateway station to make use of it. As long as you know the address of the gateway that handles your area, 
you can direct any packet message to be sent there. To find your nearest gateway station, send a packet message to AMSAT at your state's local area network, or send a message to AMSAT's gateway coordinator, KI6QE at AA6QD in California. Ask who your gateway station is. Then, contact the operator and ask how to address messages through his station. High-speed digital satellites have done more than make it easy to send messages around the world. They've opened up a whole new branch of ATV, amateur television, and they've made it available to anyone with a computer and a modem. I believe that I'm the first person uh, to transmit a digitized picture over any of the PAC sets. Uh, I transmitted a, a picture of Tropical Storm Bob uh, in what's called a GIF format uh, over the USAT Oscar 14 satellite. Now it's becoming commonplace to communicate uh, voice messages and photographs by satellite. In fact, some of the PACSATs have uh, cameras on board now and can take rather nice pictures. That's right. Three satellites, Oscars 22 and 23, and one we haven't mentioned yet, the downlink-only Webersat Oscar 18, carry CCD cameras with which they take photographs of the Earth, digitize them, and make them available for downloading. This is a picture that was taken by the USAT satellite showing the Middle East and the area up here shows the smoke from the oil well fires uh, in the Middle East after the Iraq war. In addition, hams exchange all sorts of photographs, some that they've taken and some that others have taken on all varieties of subjects. Many of these photos have been posted on computer bulletin boards. They can be downloaded by anyone with a modem, a decent graphics monitor, and a program to display these so-called GIF photos. So, there you have two ways to make use of ham satellites without ever getting on one yourself. Sending packet messages through a satellite gateway, and downloading from computer bulletin boards pictures that have been transmitted digitally by amateur satellites. Next, hams in space and a look into the future. Go for main engine start. Seven, six, five, four, three good. I'll never have the opportunity at my age to go into space. But maybe I can talk to somebody who's up there. The chances of that happening get better with every manned space launch as more astronauts get their ham tickets. There's even been one all ham shuttle flight. Many hams like to take a rig along whenever they travel, and these folks are no exception. All ham activity from the shuttle so far has been on two meters and has included voice contacts. Lima, W5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima in the spacecraft Columbia. Calling and standing by, over. Hello, Whiskey 5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima. This is Juliet Yankee number one. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. This is W5 Lima, Fox Talk Lima, coming right back. Your signals are 5 by 9 plus. I just passed over the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. I'm uh, looking down on your country right at this time, sir. Is, uh, this is Royal Highness speaking. Over. Uh, Whiskey 5 Lima, Fox Talk Lima. This is uh, Juliet Yankee 1, Hussein on the mic. Uh, right, sir, and we are very, very happy indeed uh, to hear you loud and clear. 5 by 9 also here in Amman, the capital city of Jordan. Slow Scan TV and Packet Radio. It has NASA's official blessing as part of SAREX, the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment. While voice contacts with the astronauts can be few and far between, their packet station is often left on automatic. So you take the shuttle's Keplerians, remember them, plug them into your tracking program, and try to connect whenever it's within range. The shuttle uses regular packet, so you don't need anything special. Plus, both uplink and downlink are on two meters. Specific frequencies for each SARAX mission are announced beforehand in W1AW and AMSAT bulletins. There's a very active packet mailbox aboard the Russian space station Mir, which is nearly always occupied by a ham. Mir's robot station also operates standard packet. Both uplink and downlink are on the same frequency, 145.55 megahertz. 
If the United States Space Station ever gets off the ground, it's nearly certain that it, too, will include a ham radio station. And speaking of the future, what's ahead for ham satellites? Well, we've seen some of the future right here. High-speed digital transmissions of text, pictures, and even voice are happening today. The major project on the drawing board right now at AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, is something called Phase 3D. It'll be a more advanced, more powerful version of Oscars 10 and 13, offering long hours of access and good DX to hams around the world. It should also be accessible to hams with simpler stations. Phase 3D is currently scheduled for launch in 1995 or 96. Speaking of AMSAT, if you're interested in operating amateur satellites or want to take advantage of things like satellite gateways or GIF photos transmitted by satellite, you ought to support this aspect of our hobby by joining AMSAT. Quite simply, there would be no ham radio satellites if AMSAT hadn't been there to plan them, fund them, build them, get them launched, and keep them operating. AMSAT also provides a tremendous amount of help for new and prospective satellite operators. They offer excellent beginner's guides to every satellite, plus computer tracking software and the specialized programs your computer will need for copying digital satellite transmissions. AMSAT representatives attend many ham fests, or you may contact the National Office at Post Office Box 27, Washington, D.C., 20044. While AMSAT is the primary source of help for getting started on amateur satellites, there's also a lot of good information in print. Three particularly helpful books for satellite operators are the ARRL Operating Manual, the ARRL Handbook, and the Satellite Experimenter's Handbook. Plus, of course, the major ham magazines regularly run articles on satellite operating. Finally, be sure you don't overlook the best and closest source of help local hams who are already active on the satellites. Many of them will be happy to answer questions and explain things that puzzle you. Many will also walk you through your first contacts to help assure your success. It's exciting. It's exciting to think that your voice went through the air, something else picked it up, and bounced it back down, reprocessed it, and bounced it back down. Uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, I guess it's what we're experiencing with the satellites now must be the same feeling that hams had back in the 30s where they started getting regular communications across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. That's basically what the, what the satellites mean. And while I will continue to operate them, continue to support them, and uh, will help anyone that wants to get involved. Okay, Golf Zero Echo Romeo X-ray from NX2Q. Please copy 3 Alpha, Northern New Jersey, over. QSL 1 Alpha, Kansas. QSL 1 Alpha, Kansas, thank you very much for the point. Good luck. Good luck to your 3 Alpha, Northern New Jersey. Good luck in the contest. Thank you very much. 73.